Welcome everyone to the Asian American Women in Tech Seminar. Uh, this is the third one in our series and our topic today is the evolution of technology continues. What is the future of technology in 2025? Where we'll be, we have an amazing pan, uh, group of panelists that will share their thoughts on how the unimaginable today will become imaginable sooner than we think in 2025. Our session today is hosted by the Asian American Development Center. The Asian American Business Development Center is a not-for-profit organization established in 1994. It assists Asian American businesses to expand business opportunities, to promote the recognition of Asian American businesses' contributions to the general economy. And we sincerely thank our series partner, Cisco, for sponsoring this program. The webinar series is also sponsored by Bank of America, by Hennessy, by J.P. Morgan Chase & Company. Thank you very much for our sponsors to make this possible. So as mentioned, this is our third webinar in the Asian American Women in Tech series. And today you'll hear from three share their views on what they see as a future of technology enabled on innovations in 2025, five years from now, sooner than we think. Uh, before we begin with our panelists today, I'd like to share some context about what we're seeing in the current environment and what we're seeing all around us today. One of my favorite quotes that I heard recently uh, is a great line from Davos in 2018, where Justin Trudeau, the Prime Minister of Canada, said, the pace of change has never been this fast, yet it'll never be this slow again. So as we reflect on that pace of change, um, here are some of the interesting nuggets I'd love to share with folks, just a couple of them, that make us stop and think. They certainly made me stop and think. Um, Amazon's Alexa, for example, has over 90,000 skills, had over 90,000 skills in 2019. And if you compare this to three years earlier, Amazon's Alexa had 1,000 skills. So think about, the, think about Alexa going from 1,000 skills in 2016 to 90,000 skills in just three years, right? Hard to imagine a human being evolving that fast. So you can only see how quickly and rapidly things can change. Another technology innovation I wanted to um, share that certainly boggled my mind. I was, I was, I had to read it and I had to listen to it several times to really believe it. And this was Google's quantum computer. Some of you might have already heard about it. So Google's quantum computer, late in, in 2019, late last year, said that they did a very complex simulation and Google's quantum computer did it in 200 seconds. And that same algorithm that a supercomputer would have done today would have taken 10,000 years. Now, that's what they, they were claiming. 10,000 years of something that's get, getting done today in today's supercomputers, quantum computer did it 200 seconds. So, I mean, there's just so much to think about. I, I couldn't believe that that could be true. But that's about the unimaginable becoming imaginable. Perfect, perfect, Larissa. Please go ahead. Introduce right. yourself. Uh, thank you. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Larissa Horton. I'm the VP GM uh, for WebEx Strategy and Calling. Uh, I've been at now at Cisco for about two and a half years, and I was at Microsoft for about 13 years. So happy to be here with you guys today to talk through this future. As uh, Chandra mentioned, the world has changed in ways we cannot imagine. I, the example I love to use is if I told you five or ten years ago that you would get into strangers' cars and give them your address, you would probably say there's no way that's going to happen. And yet Uber has been a change in our society that has been driven by technology in a way that we, again, could not have imagined. Jalik, over to you. 
Thanks very much. I'm really excited to be here. Uh, thanks, Sharda, for um, uh, hosting this um, and the Asian American um, Development Center. Uh, I'm Jalak Jovan Putra, founding partner of uh, Future Perfect Ventures. Uh, it's a fund I launched in 2014 to invest in uh, distributed connectivity, um, and, and that's artificial intelligence, uh, blockchain, cryptocurrency. So thinking about all the connectivity that's been laid over the last uh, 20, uh, 30 years and, and figuring out what are the new business models. So um, I started investing in 1999 in the early days of the Internet, um, and I felt really strongly about eight years ago that we were primed for another technology uh, kind of revolution, evolution. Uh, at, on par with, uh, with the scope of the internet. Uh, we're currently investing out of our third fund um, and, um, and invest globally, although we are based in, in New York City. Uh, Lars, uh, you might, Zarina, you might, you're on mute. Okay. Uh, uh, hi. Uh, let's try this again. This is Zarina Stanford, Chief Communications and Marketing Officer here at Rackspace Technology. Uh, interesting, we talk about the history and the rise of the Internet and how we got connected. Uh, I actually began in the telecommunication space, whereby we were talking about landlines so that you cannot talk to someone. And it used to cost me approximately $10 to call my mom at home way miles and miles away for just one minute. And now we are talking about reaching and, you know, look for, looking really forward to this conversation as we really think about how technology has changed our lives and shape our future. Thank, thank you, uh, Zarina. Appreciate it. Now we will hear from Larissa Horton and her keynote speech about innovation and how the digital world meets the physical world. Uh, I know Larissa, yeah. Um, slides that'll be put on and take it away. All right, so it looks like we have the slides up and running today, so let's just go to the next slide. So I thought we would start by talking about the evolution of technology and really how this has changed and progressed so dramatically. Some of these shifts, you know, we are all very familiar with, but really the last two shifts, the computer in your hand, your phone, and the way that content has been delivered basically on demand. You can watch any movie you want at any time. You no longer have to wait to rush home to see your show. No longer have to worry about the VCR recording a very specific episode. We are able to get what we want whenever we want. And honestly, from anywhere, whatever device you want to use from wherever you are. And this is really creating a change in how the entire world is working, how the entire world is consuming content and connecting with each other. If we now look at 2020, can we move on to the next slide? Now, where has the big impact been this year? Well, in March of this year, everyone in the whole world was sent home to actually work from their homes. This is a change that impacted every vertical, every business, all sizes from small to enterprise. And really, we had to reimagine how do we keep our businesses moving forward? How do we keep the world moving forward? All from our homes without our IT department, without folks to support us in the same ways that we used to have in the office. This change is something that we expect to see continue moving forward. There are many things that have changed, everything from how you stop by someone's desk and have a quick conversation, where we kind of forgot how much work we got done in that stop by, in the lunch conversation, maybe in that coffee break. How do you recreate all of the productive minutes and moments that you have as well as building camaraderie, really understanding how you build high-performing teams, build trust, build community, so that you can create the best products and services globally. With all of these changes, we also continue to look at how do you have fun? Now more than ever, we hear a lot of questions around mental health and how what we are doing as a company to make sure that our employees have everything they need to get the balance that they need in their lives. While working from home has provided flexibility for us to care for loved ones, even, even help with educating students while at home and working, it also created a different challenge, which is understanding when should I stop working? Because now everyone knows I can do my job from my home at any point in time. 
So it's really creating this transformation that really is led by technology, allowing you to be able to do your work from absolutely anywhere. And that work doesn't just start and end with a conversation, a call like Zarina mentioned, or a meeting that we're on right now, but even the ability to pick up a pen and contribute to a whiteboard from absolutely anywhere and make sure that everyone on your team can contribute equally, ensuring that everyone is a first-class participant in the innovation, creativity, and problem solving that you do every single day. Let's go to the next slide. So what's next? Today, we really wanna dig into how the digital meets the physical. Education, I think, is the example that everyone understands. We sent every student and every teacher home to then learn from home. Teachers were complaining, I don't know this technology. I like to teach students and children. That's my expertise. And yet we all had to learn. We all had to change and evolve. As some schools have started going back into the school, into the physical buildings, now we have this hybrid world where maybe half the students are in the school, half the students are outside of the school. And yet there is still one teacher to teach both of them. And they're really embracing the tool set that is available. So that whiteboard, that black, that chalkboard that everyone can use can be contributed to by both the student at home and the student in the building at the same time. Really taking the technology and evolution that's happened in business and applying it across ecosystems. When we return back to hopefully normal where everyone can go back into the building, into the school, what will that look like? Well, once you're used to some of these tools, it's gonna to be very difficult to go back to not having them. The perfect example I use is that chalkboard that you had to erase and rewrite the next day. Same thing happens at work. We create these whiteboards and we try to put a little post-it that says, please do not erase because you want to use it the next day. Well, you don't have to worry about that anymore. Now this whiteboard is stored in the cloud. That chalkboard is stored in the cloud. And when you come back tomorrow, you can pick up right where you left off. This is a change that is pushed by technology, but will change the way we work even in our physical world um, post-pandemic. And so these are the kinds of innovations that I'm definitely excited about uh, since it is really changing how we work every single day, not just digitally, but really how we interact with each other, how we make it more inclusive for everyone, regardless of where they are. Let's go to the next slide. So last but not least is really talking through where do I see 2025 and how are we going to apply all of this innovation across industries, across how people connect. So here are just a couple of those examples. I'm going to pull it over here. So first off, we mentioned the mobile device and how that is really changing the way we operate. The things you can do with your phone, you can start your car, you can do shopping, you can, like I said, call a stranger to come and give you a ride. I think those kinds of technology changes are only gonna be more pervasive as quantum computing comes into play. The ability to find jobs wherever you want to work from wherever you want to work from. There's gonna be a huge power shift and dynamic that will really influence the global economy and how you can find work that is both career driven, ambitious, and able to grow. Even if you live in the smallest town, in the smallest country, you're now able to connect. This is changing the way we all work and connect to each other because the tools are now good enough that I could be an equal participant, a first class citizen in any conversation, regardless of where I am. So that was one that I think for me is definitely exciting, is changing the opportunities available to every person based on the fact that technology makes them uh, an option now. In the past, you know, if you did not live in the big city, you would maybe not get the big jobs. That was just the requirement. And by the way, when you go and move to this big city, then you had to debate other challenges like, can I afford a home? Right? This has now completely changed due to technology. I can have the home and the career. And as a woman, I think that's actually a conversation that we are constantly having is this debate of work versus career or life or work versus life and how you continue to balance. So I thought that was another good example. Um, thinking about how employees will thrive and really supporting them in what they need to get their job done. I think companies that make these investments in technology to really enable the entire ecosystem of change in their vertical will also attract the best talent, allowing a doctor to work from wherever they want while keeping them safe. I would like to go work there instead of one that is forcing me to potentially put myself at risk 
even when I can distribute my knowledge in the same format, regardless of where I work from. There are obviously physical cases that will also be enhanced by this. When you look at manufacturing and how that will change, we saw this already in COVID. The folks that are fixing machines on the floor, you no longer have to be there because you have things like realware that can distribute that knowledge to the hands of the people who can fix it on the floor. And yet your expert is actually nowhere near that physical building. Again, taking the technology and transforming it across the ecosystem. So I thought that covered just about everything that we are hopefully going to dig in further today. Uh, so thank you. Back to you, Chandra. Uh, thank you very much, Larissa. Uh, amazing examples. You're right. There's so much about the physical world that's become um, going to be so much more digital. You know, you, you look at how medicine and telemedicine is changing and what that's going to do to our lives and how much easier certain things will be that we never thought were possible. Now, with that, I'd love to uh, dive right into the panel discussion uh, with a few housekeeping notes before we get started. And um, please, again, like Robbie said, use the WebEx Q&A function to post questions, which I'll be monitoring throughout the, the program and discussion, and we'll try and get them answered. And at the end, we'd um, I'd love for you to stay on to enjoy a beautiful violin performance by the amazing Michi Fuji, who I'll introduce at the end, who started playing violin at the age of three. And um, again, let's dive right in and into, uh, for, and I'd love to have a, qu a question for each of our panelists. Um, you know, as, um, as we look around, Asian American women have been significantly underrepresented uh, in technology as we see, in the executive and management level, and it's not for the lack of education or qualifications. You know, I'd love for you to share, each one of you, to share your personal leadership journey, your story, and how you uh, leverage technology as a differentiator and uh, to make an impact. So, um, Jalak, do you want to go first? Sure. Um, wow, that, that's a lot to cover. So I uh, was actually born in, in Kenya and uh, came to the U.S. when, when I was young and um, never thought I'd go into the business world. I was uh, a serious ballet dancer uh, when, when I was growing up. Um, I was more on the creative side. And then when I was in college, I took an economics class, which um, was my first exposure ever to, to business. And this is where I think having an open mind, um, just in general, and being a constant learner is, is certainly a key to success, uh, especially as we look at you know, the 21st century. Um, and, and then I um, uh, went into investment banking. I was actually a media and telecom and tech investment banker. The Netscape IPO happened uh, in the mid-90s while I was in um, banking. And uh, have always been very interested in, in how information flow can uh, impact development. So having been born in Kenya, being Indian, I, I went back to those countries after we moved to the U.S. So for me, what drove me, what was my true north, was, was really this passion for, you know, how can information flow impact everyone living a, a better life and reaching their potential. And, and so... Um, frankly, though, you know, it was um, a very non-diverse world, you know, on Wall Street, and then I ended up uh, in venture capital, uh, and um, we decided eight years ago that starting my own fund was the way to have the most impact uh, and, and have a point of view that was heard. Now, it's eight years ago, even, it was very different than today. There was a conversation around diversity. Uh, there's... You know, certainly so much that's come to the forefront over the last um, year, <laughs> just the last six months. Um, but I do think that women need to be in positions of power and, and uh, diversity uh, needs to be represented with equity uh, at a seat at, a ta at the table. Uh, and and I, I, you know, push younger women to, to really think about that um, and, and to... Uh, make sure that uh, you know they're negotiating for for 
um, that equal ownership, that, that salary, that uh, knowing your own worth. Um, and I, I think that is now uh, being valued in a way that really wasn't when I was, you know, coming up in the ranks. Uh, and, and that's why I'm so committed to, to making sure that I think it's better for the whole world if, if we have more, more diversity at the table. Um, and, and so I'm, you know, I think we're making progress, but every woman needs to like stand up for herself and, and fight that fight, uh, for us to really have more equality out there. Thank you, Jalak. You know, it's pretty amazing. Uh, you were, um, talking about blockchain when people couldn't even spell blockchain eight years ago, right? And you've been on every single sort of top blockchain investors list in the world and, I remember that day, uh, this was a number of years ago, where you were trying to explain to me what it, you know, how it really worked, and it didn't, uh, I have to confess, it didn't quite sink in at the time, you know, over, to, over the years, I've gotten to understand it better, but it was just way ahead, you were way ahead of your time, but uh, thank you, thank you for that, uh, for sharing your journey. Um, uh, Zarina, do you want to go next and, and share sure. your journey? Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's interesting, and I'm uh, here in the panel. Uh, we have a lot of similarity in the sense that I have to admit that I came to technology by accident. Um, I was a journalism uh, student, and I was hired before I graduated to become a writer. You know, the dream of every journalist, uh, journalism uh, student. And as it turns out, I was actually writing sales proposals on telecommunications network. Uh, for a company by the name of Intercom, which many years later actually was acquired by Cisco. So uh, I, I, uh, I became one of these homegrown, and I eventually became an engineer uh, and in the sales world. And I talk about, you know, lingo's like pulse code modulation and state of the art of everything. And it's phenomenal. And I, I, I echo what, what uh, they're like, they just said as well too, right? To come with a a spirit of curiosity, a spirit of growth, a spirit of learning. And uh, it was really miraculous in that in my late years in that company, I was actually asked to participate in a um, in an IT forum and uh, particularly of engineers. And I said, well, I am not an engineer by trade. I mean, I may be practicing by trade, but not by design and, and, and by education. Uh, how can I help? And this is where our world comes together, I think. And uh, what was asked of me was that, can you come and be a part of our community and our network? Because we engineers need to learn how to communicate. And you are a communicator, and you communicate in the technology space. So uh, I got really, really thrilled and thrown into that. And that was really my first uh, couple of years at IBM, which was uh, one of my uh, proud uh, employers in my history, in my, in my career. And there is when I really begin to open the possibilities of what technology can do. Uh, at the end of the day, I look at technology as a simple way of saying, if we want to do something, can we do it faster? Can we do it better? Can we do it more efficiently? And can, it's the same notion of blockchain. And can we do it more securely? And all of a sudden, we begin to get deep into different and multitude of technology that makes life easier, that makes businesses grow, and that makes this world more connected. And fast forward through you know, the application space at SAP and through the database, uh, data space in uh, Cinity, and I'm here at Rackspace Technology whereby as a leader of multi-cloud technology provider and services provider, that's what we do every day, is empowering businesses and individuals and our partners to really extend that business or that personal outcome. And I could not imagine a day and a moment when we don't have technology. And uh, I would step back and say, as the CMO of the company and other companies behind, there wasn't a moment where I couldn't be more thankful of having technology for this, for the art and the science of marketing. And we can tell a little bit more about that. Great. Thank you, Zarina. I mean, you, you make a huge point. I mean, this whole point about um, technology and communication, you know, most, you know, I've served hundreds of Fortune 500 clients over my life. And, 
And as you look at what takes, what's the hardest to do sometimes is that translation, is that communication mm -hmm. from the business person to the technology person in kind of communicating what you really want to do, what you want to accomplish with technology. And that's what takes the longest, it seems, sometimes. But that, but your combination of this, this tech mind with the communications mind and that combination is, is a very powerful combination, so, so important mm -hmm. uh, for Thank everyone you. out there to, to think about. With that, uh, Larissa would love to hear about your journey and, and how you got to where you are. Sure. Uh, so I was a, a little bit of a different path. My mom was actually an accountant in the Philippines, came to Canada, which is where I was born, and she decided to become a developer. So we grew up with tech um, since my mom was a mainframe developer and, you know, worked the data centers and all of that. And so I, we got to learn at a pretty young age. And she was definitely very forward thinking in all of the things a woman can do in this world. And I think we all grew up, uh, us three sisters, with that in mind. You know, there was no question of, of what we should or should not do or what we would or would not be capable of. And I think that really fostered um, my ability to then grow into very, very different roles that... I think in the past may not have been perceived as areas where you have a lot of women and definitely uh, people of color, I would say. Uh, so growing up, I thought I was going to be a lawyer uh, even through that and then decided to go into the computer science route. Um, I had a big interest in business and continued down that path. Uh, while at Microsoft, I got to try out almost everything that they were selling. So I've worked in hardware, software. Uh, you know, a little bit of everything. And I think the true north for me was very similar to uh, what Zarina mentioned, which is how do you apply technology to drive efficiency, drive, I would say, democratization of knowledge, information across the board, and keep people more connected. You know, when I was working uh, in the Dynamics portfolio and, and closer with LinkedIn, it was about how can we make the hiring process more equal for everyone, right? So today there's a lot of challenges in how you're able to find talent and hire the best talent available. Today we leverage a lot of our network uh, to find talent. And yet if you're someone that is very talented yet not connected into a network, uh, the opportunities that are available to you are very slim and far between. I then decided to move over to Cisco and there I think it's been an amazing journey really looking at all of the communication technology that connects people around the world. Just last month we had 600 million participants in WebEx. Uh, so when you think of the scale of people that you connect every single day, uh, not only to get their job done, there are folks you know who are working in telehealth and nonprofits across the world that are really providing support to communities. We support governments in how folks who are requiring subsidy and, and how they're able to distribute that support globally. Uh, so across the world, it's been an amazing journey to learn and see exactly how the world is evolving and how communication is really a key part of that. Over the course of that, I, I got to spend a lot of time in artificial intelligence, machine learning, and natural language processing. Uh, everything from the red squiggle you guys may recognize in Word that helps you spell a little bit better uh, to really looking at how you know you take a set of words and understand the meaning so that it can be uh, comprehended by an artificial assistant. So something like Cortana or Siri, uh, really starting to get that information, turn it into action. I think you talked about skills in Alexa. Uh, that was, I spent you know over five years of my life trying to see how can I go from speech to text to then understanding of that text? And really it was at the core of that, it was enabling ease of use for everyone, right? Make it easier for me to call an Uber, make it easier for me to turn off the lights without actually getting up. Uh, these are all things that were to introduce ease and yet it evolved and has changed our entire civilization. Uh, there are many children now that I hear from peers and friends that say, you know, they ask Alexa, their kids ask Alexa to do things that they would not even imagine asking Alexa to do. Uh, so when you look at how much the expectations have changed for our younger generation, you know, my children, they call grandma and grandpa with FaceTime. And if for some reason the video is not working, they say, oh, it's broken. I'm just not going to talk to you. Because the thought of just hearing someone and not seeing them feels broken. Like it's, it's almost unacceptable as an experience. And so I think it's been exciting for me to be able to take um, a, a, a leadership role in that industry and really help with that connectedness and democratization of that capability across the world. Great. Thank you, Larissa. You know, this, this whole thing about a democratization of technology and really de democratization, I think, um, 
Jala, because you were pointing out of opportunity, of providing opportunities, and Zarina, you were talking about uh, the whole sponsorship element and, and being able to pull people along is, is just huge. And, and I, I think as we look forward to the young men and women coming up, and uh, Asians uh, in particular, and given the, the, the history and the culture, et cetera, I think the time is right more than ever for us to sort of uh, catapult and sort of do a lot more and honestly reach our potential. Uh, you know, as I look at the world and I, as I look at, you know, what, what's, what's missing, I, I, I just see that, you know, what's, what's really missing is people haven't been given the opportunity to reach their potential and there's just so much out there. So with that, um, I'd like to turn to the next question. And these are individual questions that I'd love for each person, given their, their field of play, um, talk a little bit more about. And uh, think about, again, imagining, reimagining what 2025 would look like. And Jalak, I'd like to start with you again. And you know, you're a blockchain pioneer. You know, you've, you've seen all, you know, you have all these companies that are doing these amazing things with blockchain, all these different use cases. Would love to kind of get from you, um, where do you see this, what do you see happening by 2025? And, you know, who do you think the early adopters will be? H how do you think blockchain will and should disrupt things by 2025, five years from now? And um, so just help us imagine the future of blockchain in 2025, uh, a couple of use cases that might be interesting for us to reflect on and, and see and imagine what's possible. Over to you. Yeah, well, th thanks for that question. So um, my introduction to, to blockchain technology was in 2013 when I was putting together the thesis for, for my fund. Um, and I heard about Bitcoin. Um, and, and just wanted to dig in because I had already knew that, you know, machine learning, artificial intelligence, Internet of Things, sensors were all going to be part of this thesis around distributed connectivity. And I was just really curious about what this, like, magical Internet money that I kept hearing about was, was, was really about. And um, uh, when I sat there listening to the technology um, uh, behind Bitcoin, and, and Bitcoin is revolutionary and blockchain is revolutionary in that... Um, it's actually using code to verify financial transactions or any transaction. So right now, it, you know, if we go to a bank and, and say, you know, I want to wire you know, um, $100 to, say, Kenya, or, or even, you know, it doesn't even have to be Kenya. It can be the UK. It can be somewhere more developed. Um, it takes um, uh, money and time for that transaction to go through. And, and sometimes, you know, banks will charge $50 for an international transaction in the U.S. So it's $30. Um, and, and you can't transact on the weekends. The money doesn't clear for several days through our current financial system. The Bitcoin and blockchain technology, that transaction is almost instantaneous and, and costs pretty much the same. Now, if there, there's code that varies depending on demand, how much, um, you know, how much a transaction will cost, but, but it's usually under a dollar for, you know, even millions of dollars, which if you think about how transformative that is, um, you know, the fact that two billion people around the world are unbanked because banks find it too expensive to try to reach those customers at a, a price point that they can actually, you know, respond to. So, you know, someone um, who's making, you know, $30 a year is not going to pay $30 for a financial transaction. Um, so part of my that diversity and that outlook that's different was was the fact that I was able to sit there in 2013 and talk about the app or think about the applications in emerging markets um, where you know in telecom um, and I think Zarina mentioned this right uh, where it used to you know if I was in India right in, in the 80s it, you'd have to go to an operator try to get a connection. It could take a day to get that transaction or, you know, that, that, that particular uh, communication, and, and it could be cut off. Um, 
now they all have mobile phones and better connectivity in the middle of Rajasthan in a desert <laughs> than I do in you know the middle of New York. And that's where I, I see the leapfrogging of financial transactions happening through through blockchain technology. This idea of this instantaneous transaction. It's not only finance, it's any data that can be verified. So healthcare data, you know, we, we don't own our own data right now. It, it, it's, it's residing in like five different sys databases and systems. Imagine if I could verify my own data. Um, and, and so this is something, you know, I wanna let the others answer their questions, but um, you know, the early adopters are already there. We have 30 plus companies in our portfolio. Um, we've seen phenomenal growth <laughs> over, um, the last six months uh, as, as the world has become digitized, um, supply chain transparency is another use case that one of our portfolio companies is working on. Um, and, and so, um, you know, I, I've been talking to, uh, to, to folks of, as you know, about this technology for, for seven or eight years now, and I, I've never seen more interest or, or adoption happening worldwide. And, and um, I'm really excited to see where, you know, the entrepreneurs really take this next. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, you know, imagining the possibilities is just pretty amazing in terms of what it can do. Um, uh, with that, uh, Larissa would love to have you share, you know, in, in as we, I mean, I'm sorry, um, Zarina, let's go to you next and we go to uh, keep the same order, I guess. We don't have to, but um, yes. <laughs> we'll change it up. So, you know, as we were preparing, Zarina, for this session, you know, you were talking about the fact that archit the importance of architecting experiences, right? And you were talking about how that what that means to technology advances, and you were talking about what uh, what we could potentially see and what we should see uh, that's going to be different um, in 2025. So talk a little bit about this architecting of experiences and what 2025 could look at could be look like and how we could scale things up yeah. and with scale. Yeah, th thanks. So so um I, I I'm of the belief that where we where we feel the presence of the world is really through these lenses of experience, right? We each experience the world in our respective space. So let me just kind of reflect back on this year. This is a year of unprecedented reality and all of a sudden we're forced to go solve things together and just trying to figure it out right so just to put that in reality in january we got some shocks in march all of a sudden we're like okay you can't go anywhere you can't see anyone and you can't and just think of multiplying that effect to businesses and reflecting on that and looking now where we stand in october and, and I think both, uh, all three, all four of us have actually talked about that. Those companies and those individuals who harness the technology to improve the experience of either isolation or the experience of being able to continue supply chain while you are not really there uh, is going to be the first premise I wanted to highlight, which is technology, if done right, is an absolute enabler and as absolute differentiator. And putting the lens of how in the trade of marketing, we take advantage and leverage technology and insights that comes along with every one of these, what I call digital breadcrumbs. And it helps companies, whether it's companies we deal with individually or companies that we serve um, as employers or as business partners, better predict and better serve and better higher relevance. And with that in mind, I would project forward uh, to get back to your 2025 question. I think it is about the reality of new career. There are, I believe, new roles and new jobs and new world that we can't right now, standing on October 28th of 2020, can't even imagine. Just think about the role of data scientists. Who in the world would put those two words together let's say even you know eight years ago that didn't exist and i think that for the audience who are thinking and architecting your own career experience be very very bold and be very very expanded right be elastic in terms of what the possibilities are so that's one uh, one thought in terms of 2025 
the other thought of 2025 is is very much of a dream and i think we're seeing reality of it already so i think this would be where we could hockey stick and exponentially grow is in the life sciences space whether it is in medical uh, devices or is in the discovery of new drugs or in the uh, in the in the uh, telemedicine that we were just talking about earlier or in the simple fact of can we in fact self regulate and self diagnose and self predict in a sense right in terms of okay i'm feeling something what am i feeling what is the data telling me what is the tech what is this metering and this back to the old days of telecommunications what is this sniffer telling me all those are just technology that we use and i think the world is is our oysters if we decide to have it and you happen to like oysters to say how do we leverage this amazing inventions that only human can come up with? And how do we advance the entire human race for that matter? And how do we, you know, as we say it in Rackspace, um, how do we solve together? I love to see us solving life sciences together. I love for us to solve transportation together. I love for us to solve the art and the science of marketing together and being relevant together. That's kind of how I, see the see the world coming together yeah and Azarena, very very insightful yeah this whole thing about health sciences about transportation about marketing and you know you you, you connect the dots with blockchain and how that and how other technologies right can impact that it's just huge it's huge yeah, you know, right. actually, actually, you just reminded today. me you just yeah. reminded one thing too yeah. that as uh, Jelag was talking about uh, yeah. connected devices and and I'm I'm a cat lover and imagine your cat litter box is a connected device. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's happening. It's like right yes. now. Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. You know, one of the statistics I was pretty, um, I, I mean, I hadn't even thought about it, is by 2025, uh, we will see 75 billion B connected devices. And that industry, this is, a, I guess, a Gartner stat. And then, and then the, the market is going to be four trillion dollars in just connected device applications. Four trillion. It's I, I I guess it's about a one trillion today. So just to to see how how important the whole connected devices market is, as you point out, is huge. And you're right. Okay, I you know the, a very interesting cat litter box. Anything can be connected. Yeah. And I, yeah. 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 So, I so, think wearables. I'm investing. Yeah. I should ask if yeah. wearables is like. Huge, yeah. huge, huge, yeah. huge, huge. So with that, uh, Larissa, we'll, we'll turn to you. And you know, in your keynote, you talked about just so many diff- so many things and about really this physical uh, becoming more digital and enabling this new workplace of tomorrow and, and what we will see. Would love to get uh, us imagine, even if we're dreaming, uh, and because dreams come true and, you know, sooner than we think, um, what do you see potentially happening in 2025 that's not happened today already at scale and you know new uses of the future of work and how that's going to end to your point you know make it easier make it easier for all of us to do our work um i'd love to hear from you on on that topic yeah so i think there's two things that are uh top of mind for me so number one is our ability to develop uh net new technology and then number two is how ready are we as a society to actually embrace that technology? And the thing that's been really compelling is how much faster we are as a society ready to adopt that new technology as it's coming out there. I think in the past, you know, you'd, you'd see research papers and patents that get created, but by the time it actually makes it into everyday living and how it's used, um, there's a pretty large time gap. And whereas now you're seeing that shorten faster and faster and faster. So I think that's something that's going to be leading kind of how we think about the way we work. Um, We've gone to a point now, we're all comfortable talking to people without seeing them in real life. Uh, COVID forced that on on us to be a norm. It's not like FaceTime didn't exist. It's not like WhatsApp with video didn't exist. But now it's become so embedded in how we talk to people that that's changed our expectations. Uh, When I look at not just being able to talk to you and, and, and speak and hear and write together, but really how do you do together? 
without being in the same building. I think that is going to be that next evolution, right? So you're starting to see a little bit of this in the AR, VR space, but really being able to make that available across ecosystems, socioeconomic, demographics, um, I think is a big change. With 5G coming, you're going to have companies who maybe said, I it's too costly to now wire my building, to now say, I don't have to wire anything. I'm just going to go fully wireless, right? And so they're taking this leap in, in their ability to now be um, technology driven. And, you know, when you incorporate everything uh, Jalak and Zareen already mentioned, right? Um, all of the devices that will connect, all of the data that then gets generated by those devices and the information that can be brought to anyone and how you can now model that in our 3D world um, through AR, VR, I think there is a whole host of change that will come into how we work. And, and really the, the way you can collaborate and ideate together um, will, there's a bunch of boundaries that are there today that I think will actually be removed. I tell my team, the only boundary that's, that we haven't solved for really is time. Since I have a global team and the time zone is still a killer, right? When people are awake or asleep, uh, I think that's the challenge. And yet even there, we're seeing a ton of innovation of how do I give you the same rich experience of me speaking to you um, so that when you wake up, you're able to experience that, right? And so being able to have this video uh, annotation on top of any conversation or any document, any slide, instead of a note, instead of text, you're already starting to see that enrichment happen. Uh, and I think you'll only see further, right? So instead of me seeing um, a video alongside, like what if I actually saw a saw you through my AR, VR type experience, you know, I could see all your gestures and the richness of how you speak alongside that. You're able to give me your presentation like you're right in front of me. I think we'll continue to see that kind of evolution. When you take that and apply it across industries, uh, I think that's where I get the most excited, right? When you think about, healthcare available to everyone um, because that person can connect devices to their phone to actually take their blood pressure, to actually look at their, you know, sugar levels. And now a doctor that could be very far away can provide a diagnosis and be able to help and support them. I mean, you are taking capabilities that used to be logistically challenged, financially challenged, you know, there's all of these challenges that were there that now go away. And that's just healthcare. You continue down other verticals and manufacturing and service. And again, taking into account all the data that is now being produced in the world by people, by devices, by wearables, uh, you have so much more information to use to reinvent how you get things done. Uh, and, and reimagine uh, everyday things that we did. And I think that's where I'm most excited is seeing how you know, we're starting with the ability to talk to each other and collaborate with each other. But when you apply that to all of these use cases, all of these scenarios will evolve and change. So, so, so true. So true. Yeah, there's so I'm, I'm just waiting for the AR, VR uh, types of things to scale. It's just going to open up a whole different world for us. Uh, and it's so, going to take you know, people not feeling like it's weird to see others right. wearing this all the time, right? Like that's right. part of the, I think, consumer change that has to happen. I think for children, it's kind of there already. They don't find it weird because they have now grown up and yeah. immersed in this experience. But as adults, I think, you know, we still kind of have that odd look when you see someone walking around with that instead of looking you in the eye, right? So it's how do you find the new social norm and dynamic while incorporating that technology? Right. And who knows that those might become invisible over time and they might not even be visible, right? And, and you might not have to walk around with that stuff. I'll tell you, in this, in the pandemic, the one thing that we've done a lot more of is uh, happy hours. I, I never used to do happy hours before as, as much as uh, in this new world. So, so it's, it's given us new ways to connect. I know where I was watching the time. Um, uh, you know, for the audience, again, feel free to uh, chime in with questions. I don't see any. Uh, you don't have to be shy. Please, please uh, ask questions. Uh, and nothing's off limits. We'll try and answer them. Um, and so feel free. And with that, I'm trying to figure out, okay, yes, I think we're running a little low. Why don't we, and uh, you know what we do was, how, how about if we go to, Dan, uh, go to Michi, and uh, she's been uh, patiently uh, waiting for us. And this is such a treat. You know, the last two uh, episodes of this, um, we watched the performers, and that was sort of the, it, it just sort of warmed your heart. Uh, so with that, but feel free, we'll leave uh, time for questions at the end, but feel free to put in your questions while Michi's performing. But let me give a little intro. 
about Michi is I was reading her bio, I was like, wow. Um, so Michi Fuji was born in Toyota City in Aichi, Japan. She started playing violin, as I'd mentioned, at the age of three. Uh, I don't, uh, I can't even think about what I was doing at three, which was almost nothing, I, I'm sure. So in, in 2008, Michi moved to New York to continue her musical studies at the New School for Jazz and Contemporary Music, where she studied with Junior Mance. And upon graduating from the New School of Jazz and Contemporary Music, Michi became a permanent member of the Junior Mance Trio and has toured with him extensively throughout the world. Michi is featured on Junior Mance's latest CD, The Three of Us, which was released in 2012. In, in addition, Michi released her first CD, uh, Flight Number 822, in 2008. And with that, we'll turn it over to Michi for her performance. And again, folks, please feel free to just populate with questions and we're happy to answer them. So with that, Michi, take it away. So uh, are you, she's on mute. I can see she's on mute and I'm sure we'll see her in full screen soon. Um, let's see going to Robbie, the WebEx producer. You know, if you're in a room together, you'd sort of push and nudge. Uh, we need sort of virtual reality. Uh, oh, I don't believe she is ready yet. Okay. With that, you know what, how about if I, if she's not ready yet, how about if we, good point, probably, how about if we uh, throw out one, one other question for, Till and and Robbie, you can just let me know when she's ready, and we'll 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 go off that track, and we'll get right on to to Michi. One question, just um, for anyone that wants to take this, you know, if you had a magic wand and wanted to see, okay, she's getting there, getting there. So maybe someone answers a one magic wand. Anyone that takes this on a short magic wand question, what would you like to see in technology? Um, in by 2025 that would really impact the world that would make a difference in this whole world that's becoming seemingly becoming more unequal in some ways uh becoming more equal so if anyone wants to take that on while, while michi is getting settled i'll i'll, I'll give Great. it a try Perfect. lovely um uh, I, I think we're on okay i think the one magic behind all the things we're talking about is pattern recognition and if there could be some magic about pattern recognition, which is what technology has done and why it's easier, faster, and that allow us to be better musicians, that allow us to be better mathematicians and that better, you know, marketers and all the likes. And I think that also brings, and, and because we are a nation, American forum in here, I think that many of us Asians has the, has the advantage because of our language and because of our upbringing uh, that really tunes that pattern recognition skill and uh, just simple fact of how we call and how we name numbers. So if we can accelerate that, we could even be faster. Great point. Great point. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. So with that, Michi, are you, uh, are you ready or do you need a few more minutes? Are you good? Oh, it's okay. Oh, okay, great, great. So do you want to get started? Take it away. Mm -hmm. Thank you.
Magical. Can, can, I, can I ask you a question? What does flight 822 mean? Uh, well, what, what's the what's the context behind flight? Uh, I'm very ignorant. Flight number 822. Oh, that is a very very long time. I released the CD. Uh huh. 822. Uh, that's a flight number, which okay. I I'm from Japan. I come to United States. So okay. So, okay. Yeah. That was a flight. Great, great. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Appreciate Thanks so it. Much. Thanks for That's your performance. Beautiful. Yes. Absolutely Amazing. Beautiful. So uh, let's see, going back to, um, you know, we have a, I don't see any other questions come through. Um, should we go back to our magic wand question and maybe have uh, others answer the magic wand question if someone wants to take a shot at that? Uh, what would you love to do to change the world by 2022 and um, in the magic, if you had a magic wand? Yeah, I, I, I'll i jump in here. Um, I, I really want to see, you know, every, every child, every adult um, be able to, you know, access education or be able to contribute um, in, in, in terms and, and make a living off of their talents. Um, you know, one of the reasons I'm really excited about blockchain is, is the potential of, of credentialing everybody in the world. Um, so right now, I, I'm not likely to work with someone that doesn't come referred or I don't know what their work looks like. But if I was able to credential myself, um, you know, based on some tests I've taken and, and that was... Um, you know, not hackable, that uh, that was something that other people would have to independently verify, then I would be able to work with that person. And, and so I, I, I believe that we can, I, I don't know, five years is pretty aggressive, but I do think within 10 years, we're going to get to a world, um, you know, where we can live in more of a meritocracy where, and, and, and again, going back to what the comment earlier, I think that's going to be better for all of us where, you know, everyone around the world, um, uh, including little girls, uh, you know, in, in a village somewhere, you know, don't have to go to college to realize their, their full potential and, and uh, contribute their talents. Well, that's, that's a great thought, right? It's sort of, you know, in some ways, blockchain and technology really democratizes opportunity uh, for people, and that sort of creates a whole more of a level playing field than we, we think. You know, this thing about credential, you know, trust in credentials is huge, right? Blockchain can play such an important part in that. Uh, Larissa, any thoughts on you know, the the uh, wish, your, your your dream for 2025 in technology and how that could change the world? Uh, I think Jalak used the word I was going to use, which is meritocracy. Um, I, I do think when you look at opportunity, it is not equal for everyone today. And I do think that's the biggest change that we can make in the world is figuring out how do we take every opportunity that's available and actually reach all people that are candidates for that opportunity. Um, I think the, the impact of that is, is so global in nature because it will make all of us use our gifts and talents, talents better and apply it to these very, very hard problems we have ahead of us, whether that is speeding up, you know, um, I think cures to certain diseases, whether that is looking at how um, the overall ecosystem of medicine, I think, changes and progresses. Uh, applying the quantum computing capabilities to that, I think you the note you made was really interesting. When we look at some of the research going on of understanding how things happen in our body and what impacts it, both what is coming in in terms of what we eat, the environments we are in, uh, and how that impact, impacts the way we operate, uh, I think there's so much available now that you can actually go and compute every possible iteration and path. Where in the past, 
that could have taken, I think, what did you say, 10 years? <laughs> um, and so the ability to speed up all of that calculation so that you can identify the right person for an opportunity, the right knowledge that you need to solve a problem and bring that together. Uh, I think that's that would be my ideal goal is how do we take the combination of what Jalak doing and Zarina is doing across marketing, blockchain and communications and actually bring it together. Because the more you bring that together, I think the more we can deliver a true meritocracy um, across the industries. So true, so true. You know, I want to ask a, a question. Um, just, you know, we have an audience that um, I think is primarily uh, the younger generation and um, probably mostly Asian Americans uh, in the audience. Uh, if you had to, this is advice for 2025 to get prepared, right? What would be the one or two things, maybe each one of you, we, we have about, I was just watching the clock, we have about 10 minutes. Um, what would you say would be uh, advice for 2020, 2025 to get prepared uh, for anybody? It's actually sort of no age limit here um, to get better prepared for 2025. There's two things that um, three things that that someone that people should should really focus on, double down on. Uh, anyone that wants to go first? I'm happy to take a stab. Sure. Um, I think the thing that not just now, but moving forward that we have to be open to is not being so attached to who we think we need to be and actually be open to changing and learning in a capacity that maybe is unimaginable. Uh, the way you mentioned, you know, data science as a, as a role, as a career, as a job not even existing, um, I think there is going to be so much more that will change, so many more jobs, so many more opportunities, so many more problems that we're not even aware of that we'll need solving. And uh, if we get too fixated on what we think we should do and how exactly we do that, I don't think we'll be as open to all of the new ways that we can solve problems together. So for me, the, the advice I give many, I think, in that younger age group is be open to pretty much anything because uh, you don't even know what the problems will be years from now. So true. So true. Anyone else? Yeah. I, oh, sorry, Zarina. Were you? No, go ahead. Go ahead. No, you, you go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I I think you know getting more and more comfortable with uncertainty, um, which which piggybacks off of what uh, Larissa said, right? Um, where, um, you know, I, I I think one of my superpowers is is that ability to do that. Uh, when I invest in a company, or you know, when I got when I started investing in a sect in, in the blockchain sector, people thought I was crazy, and and like, but there was no guarantee. There wasn't enough data, and it kind of sounds counterintuitive in this age of increased data and information flow. But things are changing very dynamically, and and. As of yet, the computers haven't quite stayed on top of it, and 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 you know we'll we'll get there. But but I, I think you know the human brain has to be able to um, deal with with the uncertainty, with the information flow, and going off of that, I think the second thing would be ability to focus. Um, and again, maybe counterintuitive in this world of multitasking. Um, but, but the people who are going to be the most successful are the ones who are going to be able to focus their, their time and energy, at least in spurts, on, on, um, on one, one issue, one problem. Um, and that's the biggest uh, challenge I see with younger people these days, is, is that inability to, to focus. Um, and the ones that can um, are, are often ahead of those that can't. Mm. I couldn't agree with added to all those. Uh, I, I'm I'm going to just appeal to not just the younger ones, but all of us, because regardless of what age, I think these are important things to go do. Uh, but the younger minds had a much better advantage because they don't have as many filters as some of us, like myself. I've sometimes I have to remind my filters. So so number one, I think is be bold just be daring just to you know just be out there and don't stay in your comfort zone that's number one and because then if you stay in your comfort zone you're not growing you're just staying comfortable you're in your cocoon that's that's not the growing part even the caterpillar has to get out of it and second is particularly to women i think and women of diverse nature uh, background just because of our upbringing sometimes have a voice it really doesn't matter what 
your message may be, but if we don't say it out loud or express it, it didn't happen. And I've learned that from one of my managers from many, many years ago and say, Zarina, we'd like to know what is in your mind. And the only way they would do that, they, do, could, they can do that is to speak up. So that's the second. And then the third uh, advice that I would like to have is don't do it alone. You are not alone. There are many of us who are here together who could help, who could lean on and, you know, and, 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 and just test drive. And so I, I would really just anchor on those three things. Be bold, have a voice, and don't do it alone. No, very, very profound. And you know that's that's as I think about all the, the the wisdom around the table, and I'm sure in the audience as well. These are just such lifelong things that one sort of needs to really survive and thrive. Uh, you know, as I look at my personal journey and, and reflect back, is you know very much about um, the relationships as well. You know, the the big part about um, connecting with people, maybe bu building relationships um all along the way early on in your life and then honestly not worrying about um i mean investing in relationships when you really don't you know not necessarily expecting anything in return you know a big part about the philosophy in, in asia and you know india certainly that uh is, is a big thing about sort of giving and doing without expecting anything in return and and that giving and doing without expecting in return for relationships uh, I, I think sort of pays huge dividends because you're just giving, giving because you want to give and you want to contribute and you want to feel a uh, part of, um, you know, having helped somebody without necessarily expecting anything to return. So uh, it's just, just very profound. All, all these the thoughts here, uh, really, really enjoyed uh, listening and hearing and, you know, you kind of start reinforcing some of the things that we've already seen. So. With that, uh, I'll tell you one of the things that um, if, if you think about the forum that's been created here by John Wang and his team at Asian American Business Development Center does quite that, you know, helps us connect, helps us stay connected, helps us share, and helps us learn lifelong. So um, I think, uh, yeah, we're just about time, and thank you very much for joining, and thank you so much for AABDC, um, the Asian... American Business Development Center for hosting this and making this possible. And I have to thank uh, each one of you, Larissa, Zarina, Jalak, from the bottom of my heart for sort of sharing and, and you know, your words of wisdom, your thoughts uh, made, made, it, made it, hopefully everyone's found it really valuable. I still don't have any questions. I think we have a shy group, either that or uh, the questions are showing up. Um, but if anyone has any thoughts after, you know, feel free to reach out to AABDC as you have, and, and we're real happy to connect. So thank you very much again, and have a wonderful, wonderful rest of the day, and enjoy, and thanks for joining. Appreciate it. I really enjoyed the conversation. Bye. Thanks, Carter. Thank, thank you. Bye. Thank you. Stay safe. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.